All right. Hello, uh, welcome to another meetup. And uh, today we have a pleasure to have uh, Attila here. He's talking about the super asset uh, NFT. So uh, you want to get started? Go ahead. Sure. Thanks for inviting me and, and nice to see you all. I, I appreciate this opportunity to talk about this and, and share it. Okay, so uh, this won't be too long, but I, I, want, I wish to give you an overview of this super asset or this pay to NFT uh, public key hash um, that I put together for us to be able to use. And just want to give you a little background and then I'm going to share um, a code overview as well as a demo of how it works and just be able to answer any questions and some ideas of what we can do with this. So without further ado, uh, just a very quick, you know, what is a non-fungible token? It really is just really just an object that can be uniquely identified in which the essential properties are conserved. It's a history. It's a ledger from some creation event until um, you know any number of updates. You can compare it to like a title of your house, like from the, the builder or the, the land registry and how many times it's exchanged hands, what upgrades were done, what improvements to the house and, or, or like a vehicle, like a, a car's history. Um, or in the case of a based ape, it's, it's the initial <laughs> meeting from the, uh, the, the creator, the artist, the platform, uh, all the way through all the hands it's, it's uh, exchanged through and, and to in, into your possession. So the NFT is the totality of the history from the genesis, the minting event, all the way to the, the latest state. That's really what an NFT is. It's that entire history. You could think of it as, as like also like physical art, like say the Mona Lisa, uh, you want a complete record of, of custody and ownership that gives it extra value. The same thing with comic books and sports jerseys and things like that. It has more value because you have that, that chain of, of, of um, the ownership, that record. That's really what an NFT is in the most abstract sense. It's just a, a unique object through space time that's recorded um, unambiguously. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, I really want to get down to the core essence of what that is because you know, we see a lot of contracts where like on Ethereum, there's this ERC 721 standard, which imposes certain restrictions. We have various platforms that have emerged with their own NFT spec, and they're really like doing too much. They're really assuming the collectibles paradigm when really an NFT is just history through space time, which could be a software license. It could be, um, it could be collectible, of course, or it could be uh, a record of physical property. It really could be anything. So I want to get down to the, the core essence of what that is so we can actually build anything that's possible to be built uh, with absolutely no restrictions or at least the absolute minimum possible restrictions with the maximum flexibility. So what does that mean in practice? What, what can this super asset do? Well, we can um, basically bind any history or any logic and any data up to four gigabytes in this a smart contract uh, we have the same security as regular UTXOs. It's self-evident. You have um, SPV working as you would expect. And everything has to be on chain. Of course, you can't accidentally spend or, or lose it um, unless you want to on purpose, destroy or melt it. Uh, we want to be able to handle polymorphism. So there's no reason why like a based ape NFT shouldn't be able to morph into an auction on chain using like one of S scripts. Uh, you know, there's an auction contract there or another one that's built. Uh, and be able to morph into an auction. Uh, and then the winning bidder would, you know, it would morph back into the lightweight NFT by maintaining that consistent history. That, that should be possible. And we should, we should not need to know about that up front because you can't handle all the cases that you can't predict what's going to happen. But with a lot of these NFTs contracts, you're, you're kind of set in stone yeah, in, in a bad way where you don't have any um, upgradability and any, anything you can change later on, kind of lock yourself into a certain protocol. Uh, so we want extreme efficiency, minimal restrictions, and as well as just generally, we need a platform where we can index NFTs highly efficiently, um, ideally directly in the BSV node. The BSV node is really good at indexing UTXOs, maintaining the chain state and, and, and the spend index. So why not leverage that so that we can get those 10,000 transactions per second um, that we already can do with 
regular Bitcoins, but apply to NFTs and just distribute that under an MIT license. And anyone can just run a, a, a lightweight pruning BSV node that just indexes your NFTs or all the NFTs and ignores the rest of the chain while still providing the same security guarantees and SPV. So that's that's really the, the goal here. I want to be able to produce an open you know, spec that that really meets everyone's needs uh, with maximum efficiency so that we can just kind of move on and, and create uh, some really cool things on top. Um, by the way, it's just a small, if, if someone has any questions that's just really a burning question you think would add, just feel free to jump in and ask me and I can um, answer that, so. Sure, uh, for me, uh, mm -hmm. two questions, a quick, why is, what do you mean by morph? Like uh, you now I have an NFT, you say you morph into some kind of like an auction item or what it, yeah. what it exactly mean? Is it still the same NFT, but now it has a, it can be auctioned or what? What Correct. You, so, what? yeah. So let's say um, I'll use the based ape example and assume that let's just assume that based and the based apes were minted with a super asset or this this little protocol I'm going to show. You should be able to transfer that to people. Like you can sell it, you know, according to uh, rules, or you have an off chain exchange. But you should be able to take that NFT, the code, and you should be able to do an update in real time or, or you know, after the fact and, and put it into like an auction contract. And then when that auction is, uh, is, is you know, some, a high bidder wins that auction, it should be able to, the code that was running the auction that might be say a kilobyte or whatever in size, we should convert that back to the lightweight NFT without losing that, that thread of history. Right, because an NFT okay. is just a unique identifier through a chain of spends. Uh, you know, it's a linear history, and and if we can maintain that linear history right back to the minting event, then then in any intermediate step, you can you can change the contract and redeploy a new version. Um, you know, the rules execute like an auction; it could be bid on many times, and then finally, when it's won, the high bidder wins that auction contract, and then to save space they can morph it back to the lightweight NFT that's only 242 bytes or whatever. And that way you don't have to encode all the rules for auctions, um, royalties. You don't have to know that up front in the NFT and deploy this monster several kilobyte contract. You could just work with the lightest weight possible and on demand change the code to whatever you needed to do. And then, and then once you're done, go back to the original. It's, I call that polymorphism. Okay. Is that, does that answer or more questions about yeah, that? Yeah. So, so basically, now, first you have this uh, uh, super asset FT, like let's say contract, you have this format, right? It's very lightweight. So later on, if you spend it to like auction contract, the, the locking contract actually changed. And then when you are done with whatever, it's like, a, yeah, I wouldn't say the word, I don't like it, uh, shape shift, right? <laughs> so you change, shape -shift, change yeah. it into, into one form. And then when you're done, you come back, right? It's auction, I don't know, it's a lending, staking, whatever, right? Okay. Uh, exactly. And, and, and the key to this, uh, I'll go into the details. It, you're absolutely right. That's what I mean by, by morphing. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So, so a second one, I, I think I have to, right? How do you, mm -hmm. uh, so do you still have the back to the Genesis uh, problem? Because uh, if you're UTXO based, uh, uh -huh. Tokens, yeah, usually have that problem. I, I know one yeah. advantage for NFT is NFT you cannot speed and merge, right? So that so it's linear, so it's much easier. But still, correct. Do you still have it uh, to a certain degree, or how do you overcome that? Yes. So the the back to the genesis problem is really only a problem in fungible tokens because of the split and merge, and you end up having to store basically the entire DAG. But with an NFT, you have a linear history. And, and so I argued um, that actually for NFTs, you actually want everything back to Genesis because it's the only way to be sure that you have the complete chain of custody. So like, for example, if someone sells you a car and it's a collector's car, if someone presented you with the latest transfer record, you, you still probably as a collector, you'd say, well, I still want the entire records. The, the car, the collectible is worth more when I have all the paperwork. 
And, and, and that's why you go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and you, you get your car registered, you get your car history. And same with like comic books or jerseys or signatures, you want that complete chain because that actually adds value. And that's the only way you can tell that there's no funny business with the, 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 the chain of custody or if there's no forgery with any piece of art. So you do have this, I'll call it a problem, but it's, it's actually intractable and, and it's not even desirable to just have the latest because you, you actually really just want to know you have the whole thing. So for instance, uh, in the case of an NFT, because it's a linear history and we say we only have 250 bytes per um, output. And, and so if you multiply that out by, let's say 10,000 transfers, let's say there's a based ape okay. of, or um, you know, a frog it. cartel yeah. NFT, right? You know, 10,000 transfers is only 2.5 megabytes. Uh, like I see. It's, it's, it's really negligible and even in the case of a hundred thousand transfers you you i mean 25 megabytes that's like two high resolution 4k photos so so that's my answer is to sidestep and say well you can't do anything about that um, but for nfts it's actually desirable that we have the whole thing anyways um, now I'll, I'll make a note here that the the nice thing about this is because it's deterministic any BSV node or any indexer that indexes these NFTs is going to arrive at the same, uh, we'll call it, let's call it a Merkle root. So every block that's processed, an indexer can take all the NFTs in it and then Merkleize it and publish a Merkle root for that block. And then independent verifiers or independent businesses or adversaries can, can come up with the same Merkle root and they're going to know instantly whether they're all in sync with each other or not because of the published Merkle root. We can yeah. even do this in a way where the Merkle root is like concealed and only revealed after the fact, so they can't cheat. So there's a way to keep everyone in sync in the network uh, uh, without, um, without having to have a prior arrangement. And the moment there's a, there's a, a forgery or a, a bug, we're gonna detect that in the most recent block. So there's ways we can keep in sync with each other uh, and know that it's correct. Uh, but in general, in practice, when you're, you know, you have a, your, your um, Sensolit wallet or your Volt wallet that's coming out, I envision that if it's an NFT, you're just gonna wanna pass along the entire history from one wallet okay. to the next. That's the peer-to-peer -peer model of even UTXOs that we're talking about with Electrum SV, that you have your UTXOs backed up for that reason. Um, and I think the same thing will happen with NFTs. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and uh, that's why I also uh, focus on uh, NFTs because it's uh, it's easier. It's linear history, right? Um, I'll leave yes. the fungible token to the uh, other experts on that. Okay. Any other questions? So when it does these uh, morphs, is it just the morph in terms of the royalties, or is it like a is it like a change of the NFT? I didn't quite understand that part. Sure. Sure. Let, uh, let something me, great. Can, can you? Attila, can you tilt the, your, your, your camera down a little bit? Can, can, can suddenly see your like, forehead or something? Can you tilt sure, it down sure, a little sorry bit? About oh, that. yeah, yeah, much That's better. Thank you. Me, let me actually share something. This whole time I thought I was uh, uh, actually just um, didn't realize I wasn't sharing the screen. So my apologies. I'm going to share the screen right now, and then I'll show the, um, a, a demo of uh, what's, what's going on here. It's just one moment. Chao might have to approve the share screen if I remember correctly how the admin does it. Yes, if you if you don't mind, uh, that would be that would be uh, that would be nice if you can um, if I can share the screen. Let me see if I can share open system. Oh, so, uh, your microphone is muted. Oh, it's already enabled. Go ahead. Okay. Um, it won't even let me share. Uh, let me. Um, when not, I you may have to restart Zoom if you're on Mac OS and you're getting permission. I'll, I'll read going quick. Oh, man, there's Zoom clear. <laughs> yeah, there's, as I said last time, right? Whenever you have a problem, throw the Merkle, Merkle tree, solve it. So, <laughs> nah. It always works. So. It always That's applicable works. to Bridgeport uh, state synchronization as well. That's very of interesting. Course. Of course, it's everywhere. <laughs> hey. Hello. You're back. Oh, okay. Good. Go. Okay, good. good. Great. So my apologies for that, guys. Okay, good. No problem. Okay, so the, the question was that 
how does this morph work? What is the nature of that the code being updated? And I'm going to explain that now, um, how, how it works. So it, it, there's two parts, really. So if we think about what an NFT is, it's really just a, a data, um, the an asset ID, like a unique identifier, and, and an owner it, through being tracked through the minting event, through the chain of of, of, um, of signatures. So in order to do that, introduced a little protocol called pay to NFT PKH or pay to NFT public key hash. And, and so it follows this format here. This is 63 bytes. And what it is, is you do a data push of the an out point, like uh, 36 bytes, and then the address. And then we have this instructions to like uh, opt nip over and then do the check sig verify. And what this does is it, it basically just ignores the asset ID um, and then just checks the, the owner. Now, why is this useful? Well, if you see what a mint looks like, you have the 36 bytes at the beginning when you mint an NFT, you set it to all zeros, and then you set the initial owner. So then the only rule we have to follow is in the subsequent transfer of this, um, this deployed contract, we just set the 36 bytes, the asset ID, we set it to, oops, oh, here we go. We set it to, I'll just, I have the demo here. We just set it to, oh, let's go back here. Here's an example. Um, here's the deployed. Um, never, this is the larger contract, but the concept is the same. You have the 36 bytes. And then when you transfer this, you set the 36 bytes to this current transaction ID and out point. So I'll go backwards. This is a, a, a transaction. It's going to go backwards in history. And I'll show you that when we spent it, you see we spent it with the zeros. And then the new contract includes this, the out point of where it came from. And you can see, look at the AB4C. This is in Little Indian. AB4C is the 4C AB here. Okay. And so that's as long as we follow this convention where the the push data, uh, the first two push datas are the asset ID, which is the out point of the, the the minting transaction, and then the second push data is the the pub key hash of the owner. If we follow that through and we just think about it, um, that means we have an unambiguous history, uh, right? Because that's all an NFT is. It's an identity through time, it's unambiguous. There's a single owner that can transfer it, okay? So that's what this, um, that's what this pay to public key hash is, is just the, the smallest possible, the smallest possible NFT that could work. And, and it, it really took me a while to like accept this as, as like, okay, this is, this, this, is, this is almost like, this is a convention. And the reality is, that's what all NFTs are, is that it's a convention that you just transfer this record, and then at any time you can melt it or destroy it. What's the difference of melting or destroying um, explicitly or just purposely messing up the history? They're, they're equivalent. So now that we have this, we, this convention that the asset ID is the first push data, then the address is the second, um, we have an NFT. Now, there's one problem with this. The one problem is, well, here it is. So we have the convention and we can just follow it. But um, the difference is, what if the programmer or the wallet just screws up? What if they you know, don't use a SIG hash single and they combine it in a way and then they, they, they destroy your NFT by mm -hmm. accident? Well, just, they, that could happen. Can I say something quick? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you say at the beginning is uh, the first the first field is initialized to be all zero, right? And then from then on, you you change it to the real out point for the minting for the minting transaction. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That is correct, and you maintain what, what it if, the entire. What life. if you you it's transfer it again again? Do you still use the minting, or you you always use the last parent the out point? You always use the minting because that's oh, how minting, you know. Okay. Oh, you, you don't you don't oh, update oh, even okay. you keep transferring. You don't correct. update. Okay. Correct. Okay. Just to make and, sure and I understand. Got it. Yep. And, and that's, and that's, the, that's like the, the minting baton technique that I think you outlined. Oh, okay. Before. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. just okay. always maintain the minting baton. 
and and see, we don't need to use op push TX. And like, and I had, and because it's kind of like this. This I love this picture. This is an action shot of op push TX maintaining the non-fungible token standard. It's like, okay. like well, what's the difference between having a melt function or just intentionally messing up the history? They're equivalent. Like from a programmer's perspective, you can either just choose to maintain the history and you have unambiguous proof that you're you're the owner, or you could just melt it into another format. It, it, there's no need for all this extra code for a layer one NFT. You really only need the 63 bytes. Now, okay, but what if we want a little bit of extra security where maybe we want to just, you know what, let's use our push TX to enforce some rules. So what can we do? Well, if we um, expand on this a little bit, we can actually get an op-push TX-based contract that enforces the SIG hash single and the op-push TX. So you can't accidentally spend it unless you explicitly choose to melt it. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so the super asset NFT is in fact the same thing as the P2 NFT package in the sense that the asset ID and the owner is the first two push datas. So if you think about it, an NFT really is only two push datas in the, in the purest sense and anything after it can be arbitrary. So what is this code here? Well, I'll show you. Um, here's the super asset NFT where the first two push datas is the asset ID and the pub key hash. And here's a note. I found that if, if you don't provide a default constructor, uh -huh. Then yeah, you, yes. you, the first two push datas are the actual data state of the contract. And now what's amazing is everything else in the unlock function comes strictly after. And what this code does here is it enforces that you must spend it exactly the same way using the pre-image and, and you must uh, um, maintain the rule. If you see here, if the asset ID is all zeros, then you must set it to the out point in the pre-image. Otherwise, you must immutably maintain the asset ID. Okay. And now there's this is transforms. This is what I was talking about where you can morph it into something else. If this flag is set to false, you must spend it exactly the same way and repeat you know, the same 242 byte contract. If on the other hand, you say is transform is true, well, then you can melt the NFT back into anything you want, or you can morph it into an auction contract, right? An auction or a cash flow or any kind of contract, as long as the contract starts with asset ID and pub key hash, you can have any arbitrary rules here and deploy it in sequence. So you would spend this NFT, like it's a based ape, maybe it's the, the base version, and then you want to create an on-chain auction, someone would write the auction here, deploy it, then they would spend the input with is transform is true, and then deploy the new contract while still maintaining the asset ID rule and then to the new owner. That's the way we can achieve polymorphism is that we, uh, consist we maintain the consistency of the two push datas here. And, and the rest, everything behind doesn't matter. So this format is, is pretty amazing because now in the BSV node, we just, we're always just looking for the original 36 bytes for a minting event. Oh, that's a minting event. Okay, now track in the BSV indexer, like in level DB, track that this is now an NFT minting event. Here's the current owner, much like uh, UTXO. And, and now we maintain that until it's broken. So the way the BSV node I've written, which I will open source soon, is that when the out point, um, the asset ID is, is broken, like changed, that's a melting event um, and, and the NFT ceases to exist. Now, and that's why if you morph it into an auction contract and redeploy with the same out point, it maintains that linear history. And this is how we achieve polymorphism. Um, it's very similar to C++ where the object layout, the, the, the binary code for an object is laid out in such a way that you have the, you know, the, base, the base class data looks the same when you, when you slice it at the beginning in the, in the binary layout. Uh, any questions so far or anything I've, that doesn't quite make sense or I'm, I missed over? So it doesn't really matter what the codes or the, uh, the code is so much. It's just the first... Uh... 
you know, the first two fields that stay the same. That's exactly correct. That's right. As long as the asset IDs maintain the same position of all subsequent spends, then all indexers and applications can trace the NFT transfer history unambiguously until it is melted or, you know, the history is broken. Yeah. All right. So it's starting to make sense, but uh, I got to rewatch this. Yeah. And, what's, and mm -hmm. uh, what's the difference between the up push transaction version versus the, the, the now push TX version? Right. So, so the, the difference is that the, the let's take a look at the the P two NP cage. Let's say uh, you create you mint, a minting event with this, and here's an example. Let's just go on chain. Um, oops, I want to see the classic view. Oh, uh, basically, the difference is. Oh, why can't I see? Oh, that's because. Oh, here we go. Get zoom out of the way. Okay, so you can see here at uh, NPKH. Um, well, when we spend this, some a developer could um, maybe they wrote a bug into it and and they ended up spending this, but they didn't maintain the sig hash single. Like maybe they created multiple outputs, and they didn't line up the input to the output, right? Because with in order to trace the history unambiguously, you need the the, the same input number index needs to match the same output number. So if you don't use the op push TX version, a wallet or a programmer could make a bug, right? Where they, okay, they did the mint properly, but then, but then they did a transfer. Here's a deploy, here's a transfer um, here. And, and maybe they, they wrote a bug into it where maybe they wrote the out point in, instead of little endian, they accidentally did big endian. And then they spent it, and now they destroyed the base that the beloved base ape that they had because of a bug, and now they lost the base ape forever because they accidentally basically melted it. So the the PDNPKH does not provide you with like safety guards. Like you could actually mess it up very easily. Whereas the the um, super asset, the up push TX version, protects you because if you look in. I'll pull up the code. If you look in the code, you can't spend it if you just say is transform is false. It'll just give you an error because it's an invalid transaction. So that's really what the op push TX is getting you is a safety mechanism where the default operation is that you can't spend it except if you have it perfectly right. Now, you could still mess it up if you transform into an auction and you messed up your auction script and you were careless. You can still destroy it. But the same argument can be made for any NFT where you send it to a bad address that no one has the, the, the private key for. It's the same argument. Um, so that's the difference. One, you know, the super asset NFT uses op push TX to give you a little bit of extra safety. But also, more generally, if you want an auction contract, you probably don't really want to rely on the convention. You actually want to enforce it in the op push TX. And so this doesn't do much on its own until you build out the logic for whatever you want. And then that op push TX check really provides you with the extra security and safety uh, th that you would want to, to feel confident that you're not just gonna, you know, some bug isn't gonna destroy people's NFTs. That's the difference between the okay. two. Okay, just make it harder to accidentally burn your NFT, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay. And that's by, totally- by the, Yeah, by the way, your camera is off for some reason, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, is, is the- um, yeah, that's screen, screen. Screen, screen sharing is good. Okay, perfect. Let me just check. Um, oh. yeah, not a big deal, I bet. Just let you know. No, okay. uh, thank you. I'll just start the video. There we go. And, okay. Okay, so, so in, in practice, um, what this looks like is, well, I, I think that's, I mean, that's really the, the, the overview of this is that we can really now, following the convention that if in S script, or even any programming language, have the asset ID and the pub key hash as the two first push datas. And then observe in the code is a little side effect I noticed is we don't actually have to check the locking script in the pre-image. We can actually just use the push data on the stack directly. That's really cool with S script that just because it's on the stack, you can kind of enforce, you don't have to look into the locking script to slice out data because it's already on the stack. That's what's really cool about having the state at the front is we get all these benefits of it's just less code. 
and following this convention, um, any indexer that's going to index the minting event and any subsequent history, they're all just going to work. And you don't need to know what you're coding up front, um, what kind of NFTs you're going to create later. It just doesn't matter. Uh, you can just create anything. The, the side of this, the JavaScript side, this is, by the way, in the boilerplate code and GitHub. So thank you for merging that in and reviewing it. And the way it works is you have to do some calculations up front uh, to be, I tried to squeeze the maximum number of bytes out as possible. And so you end up having to uh, basically encode the output with the actual size of the script. The reason for this is let's say you write an auction that ends up being two kilobytes. Well, we couldn't hard code in like the, you know, the plus, you know, um, F, F, D, whatever it is, because then that would make it rigid. So we had to make it so that the programmer provides the length of the output. And it's also, it also saves us some, a few bytes. So that's, that's some of the things we you had to take care of is, is that the programmer in the JavaScript land is going to be the one to encode the output size. And in this case, we're sending a certain, you know, um, certain NFT amount. And then we see we're encoding um, the output size of the script, which is uh, 242 bytes in the case of uh, the release version. Um, and this gives this means that you don't have to change the base. And we can always detect that it's, it's in a base because we could take a hash of the whole thing and get like a script hash type of thing. And so uh, that's that's it. The tests run, the, the deployment um, functions well. I'll do, do a very quick demo to prove that I'm not um, making this stuff up. And... Here we go. We'll just do. Um... Can you make it uh, uh, larger? The font size. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Say that again. Can you make uh, the, the the just make it bigger? It's a little bit hard to read the, the text. Got it. Okay, I will make it bigger right now. The, uh, the easiest way to do that's probably just going to be to change the display resolution. But I don't know, Man, maybe you just can zoom in. Or not, not a big issue, yeah. Because there's no way to like change the font of a browser like that. that also, you can, you can this do a command, command plus. Oh, this is on the command line? Yeah, I'm just going to know. If you can see that now or? Yeah. I, I can see it. it. Oh, OK, yeah, I can see it. Yeah. I don't know it's if it's fine. bigger, but I can see it. Okay, it's fine. I'll increase it a little bit more just in a second. Because uh, this is a recording, so other people may want to see. That's the only reason. Yeah, I can see it, but it's the bigger, the better, basically. Yeah, yeah, much big, bigger. Okay, it's that's so funny now. Um, okay. And I, I dump out some debugging information because it's helpful when you want to do the launch.json in VS Code. That way you can plug these values in for the, the SIG hash pre-image, et cetera. So I want to first go to, you can see the template. It dumps out as well as about to deploy the NFT. And you can see the deploy ID. So here's the, here's the TX. And then here's the asset ID, which is just the little Indian version of the TX ID and the output number. And anyways, it ran. I'm going to go to the end. And the final TX is the melted TX. So we have, we melted it back using the is transform. We melted it back into a regular P to PKH. So you can see here, we called the is transform function. Um, let's take a look. Um, in the, the input, we ended up, oh, this is not exactly what I want to look like. You can see there's an op true, is transform is true. And then this allows us to melt it back, you see, into just a regular P to PKH because there's no checks on the outputs anymore with op push tx this is the op push tx version right this is correct this is okay. the op push tx i'll go up one level and you'll see here so you have to be explicitly buried basically to uh set that to be true so that's correct if it's if it's so set it's, to false, it's very high yeah so it's very high and a specific field to be for true so that's hard to to for you to do accidentally get burned right okay makes sense that's right that's right. And, and I, I, I wanted a, and that's the, the PDP NPKH I really like because if, if you're extra careful, then in theory, you can get down to 63 bytes um, and then add on to it. And, and we don't know how these compilers will evolve over the years either. So I wanted something that would be a standard that will last 100 years and meet every single possible use case we, we ever, 
will ever need. Um, so I, I didn't think it was possible, but using this convention, I, I think we can we can say this is probably a pretty good NFT bare bones for the next hundred years. I, I don't think we can get, actually get any simpler than this and more powerful either. Um, just, a, just a note here is that, okay, but this doesn't actually answer. How do you store like images and, and like other data? Well, the beautiful thing about this is this doesn't provide you, like it doesn't restrict you. And so the developer can decide what it means for them, for example, Here's an op return. So when you do a transfer, you can have any number of op returns. It could be an image or PDF. You can create your own convention with this. So we, it's not prescriptive. We're not saying, oh, you must do it like this. The beautiful thing is a standard can emerge on top as a higher layer of, oh, the, the, the deploy has an image or a PDF with the license agreement. And every, you know, the first minting event becomes a separate, you know, generated, um, uh, you know, crypto kitty or whatever. It really just doesn't matter. Now, just a note here is if you wanted to include like a generative NFT where the, the first spend or the first, how do you put it? The, the output contains like a unique image or some unique, well, then, then we can do that. All you have to do is add a third push data. We could call it like, we could call it like um, unique item hash. And, and just set this to be maintained, um, just set it to be maintained for the lifetime. And this will still conform to the specification. So you could like have it directly in the UTXO. You don't need it in an off return uh, along, along, alongside it. You can still have it embedded in the UTXO. And that's literally just how easy it would be is that you just add a third push data. That would be some unique hash, you know, mint, mint a, you know, a, a based, animal of some kind with 10,000 outputs. And the third argument would be like maybe the, the generative hash or something like that, or it could be a, a TX ID to a, a file that specifies the attributes. So that's another way to do it. That's the beauty. There's no restrictions um, on, how, on how to use this. So anyways, um, I, I really appreciate get, having the opportunity to explain this, uh, but I'd love to be able to answer any other questions uh, about this or anything I can go over. So you are showing here have the super SFD uh, op transaction. Can you go back to the VS Code? Mm -hmm. You're showing the op push TX version, right? Do you have the non push TX version? Is it like yeah. a assembly? Yeah. Like a, is it S? Oh yes. SSN? Thank you. Good point. Yeah. Yes, I do. Um, and just to note, yeah, the there's unit tests for NFT and the P to NFT PKH. So I'm going to okay. show you the P to NFT PKH. Oh, okay. In yeah, that's what, which is okay. Right, okay. just the inline asm. Yes, that's good. Okay. And cool. and what that looks like in in JavaScript land is we don't really need the S script compiler. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, no. Let me back up. We, it's an optional thing, right? We can use the S script compiler, but really, it is uh, pretty easy to construct uh, by hand as well because it's only like I think six instructions. So here's the code where we're going to mint the NFT. But we need to do the ASM replacement because, of course, yes. it's an inline ASM. So we do the PKH and the asset ID are just, okay. uh, you know, as ASM replacement variables. And that's it. And so cool. this is also, cool. I'll, I'll demonstrate this as well. Uh, let's just run it, the, the, the deployment and see what happens. NFT. Here we go. Okay, so let's just write it run and then we'll trace it backwards from the... Uh, the final step. So that's the melted TX. So now it's made it. Does it get transferred once or twice or something in between? It before gets transferred you three times. Oh, yeah. All right. So you see here we melted it. This is the final mel melting destruction event. And you can see here we, um, Oh, uh, you know, I, I made a mistake. I I, I actually used the, there was a slight uh, version change. Oh, 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 I see, but, I see. but it's okay. I'll start. I, I will, I'll start. I, okay. I will actually fix it. But it's okay. It's the same concept. You can see here that we we spend it and it's just the minimal instructions. Okay. Um, You're using the alt stack. Okay. This is, yeah, this is the alt stack version. This is, a, this is a, we'll edit this out. Uh, no, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and modify it. But the, the same principle applies is that you're just creating, uh, you know, a chain of spends using the, the lightweight format. Cool. So, yeah. Any other questions or thoughts that anyone has? Um, 
You mentioned uh, you mentioned this uh, thirty six byte. Uh, push uh, at the beginning as the first element with the TXID and uh, output index. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if I want to filter out uh, this protocol from the various other protocols, I mean, eventually, you know, with the with you know the the billions of, of transactions and other you know use cases of BSV, not every thirty six byte uh, initial uh, push is going to be um, a TXID and uh, and vout number. So, have you considered putting an um, another like protocol identifier uh, at the beginning mm -hmm. to kind of differentiate this protocol from other protocols that exist using a standard such as perhaps like Bitcom or or something like that? And 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 that way you also have a, a public key that's kind of tied to uh, uh, protocol governance. And then what you could do is put another NIP opcode. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning, and it would also open up the ability for tools like, uh, you know, I guess BitQuery unwriters like BitBus and BitSocket and, and things like that. I could just write a thing that says, you know, give me all the, like if I want all Mint events, but also all transfer events um, for all NFTs or for a specific one, um, if I want to write a query that, that returns that. Um, I mean, having a way to kind of differentiate and identify this protocol uniquely uh, versus any other protocol that might happen to exist where we're just putting things uh, and then indexing them. Uh, you'd also see less interference on your end with any of those uh, future protocols that, that might exist. It's, it's an interesting point. Uh, I actually really thought about that namespace question and so it's a little noisy here. I, I thought about the namespace question, but it, the indexer doesn't have a problem if, if you are looking for all zeros. So if the rule is that you only start indexing if the first push data is 36 bytes of zeros. And, and so I kind of thought, well, that is kind of like the namespace. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the null value. Right. And, and you only need to index after that. And, and to achieve maximum efficiency, you want to, your indexer will pick up the 36 bytes. If it's not all zeros, it just discards it. But then if it's 36 bytes of something else, then you look in your spend index, like your- Okay, I get it. You can, you can just say, here's a query for anything that's 36 bytes without caring what the uh, value is. So I could write a generalized query that, that does that. Exactly, and and it, the the thing though is that you you're right though that it you couldn't just say give me everything that's for NFTs with like 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 BitQuery or BitBus because you could end up picking something else that just happens to use 36 bytes for any other purpose. It really, mm -hmm. the um, the benefit of this is at the the lowest possible level, exactly like the UTXOs are being indexed, like you're checking. Uh, right, when right. it's a Coinbase event, like a, an actual Coinbase, the coins are emitted from a miner, then you're always checking into your map that gets added to the map. So I call this like an NFT base in the sense that the all the 36 zeros are basically analogously the same as a Coinbase emission of 36 bytes of zeros for the pre TX out. That's what they of use in the Coinbase. Yes. And if I added an extra namespace, it's yeah, kind of adding add. something that's not really necessary mm -hmm. because what other applications would signify 36 bytes of zeros? Well, I mean, isn't that just going to be the same kind of NFT? And since it's in, it's, in, it's the absolute minimum possible specification, it, they would only be using that if they actually wanted it to be indexed like an NFT. I, I get what you're saying. I, I just, I, I, I wasn't convinced that, that I wanted to, you know, add a, a namespace. Now, that being said, you could add in the third argument here, you could add a namespace, right? Because you can add any parameters right. after. And then for your use cases, you can go ahead and just filter in your domain. Mm -hmm. But then like someone like me or someone else that just says, yeah, just give me every NFT. I don't really care how they're namespaced. Mm -hmm. uh, we can still do that transparently, okay. but then you still have the opportunity to go ahead and namespace at your mm -hmm. level. So it's a very good question. I'm glad you asked it because uh, it gets to be a little bit meta. Of course, it does, and I think that definitely makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and for for my for my use case, even using something like BitCore, you can write, give me where uh, out dot uh, you know what is it S zero or whatever the link is is thirty six. Um, 
using the MongoDB like a uh, operator site. I do believe I'm not I'm not certain on that, but but either way, I mean that that definitely makes sense and it provides a a, a good answer. Great. Well, um, I just want call to action. Like, if anyone would like to, uh, you know, help in integration, running tests, or any ideas, I'm, I'm available for that. I, I would just love to have this um, just be, be used. It doesn't impose any restrictions. It's all completely MIT open source. We even documented here the exact ASM opcodes. Second version is a little bit hand optimized. There's a third version coming. Um, a baguette. Uh, uh, on in our in the S script channel, actually optimize it further, and he wrote a racket version, which I'm going to add in, which saves another 20 bytes, I think. Uh, so we're, he's also decided to open source that under MIT. So we have the the raw ASM, as well as um, the S script version available for everybody. And I will be launching something with uh, with based names or based.org that's going to be using these. And I needed a really highly optimized NFT that doesn't impose any restrictions. Uh, for for what I'm going to do with that project. So, but if anyone else has any anything that they'd like um, help with, I'm I'm available. I'd love to just be able to assist, and so that we can, um, uh, you know, we could build cool stuff together. Oh, so thanks for the to, No problem. Time to aping. <laughs> Whatever you <laughs> kind of base the ape on now. Yeah, we should all, all right. aping. Awesome. Thank all right. You. Well, thank you. So yeah, just on a high level, uh, okay, we have a lot of NFTs already running on BSV, right? So how does this uh, compare to others? Like what are the pros and uh, if there's any con? Uh... Um, well, the pros of this is that, um, I, as I understand, this is the most efficient um, in terms of space, so uh, as well as it's the most flexible. And I think it's the only one that's actually able to do polymorphism. And it's something as simple as a convention. And it's, it's so I, I think in terms of efficiency, that's the pro. The con would be, well, you already have these existing NFTs in a certain format. And so if those formats are closed formats or non-upgradable formats, then there's no clear migration path unless you burn them. Uh, maybe we start at reminting as a service. Yeah, almost like a, migrate. <clears throat> almost like the the what the token swap is doing. Basically, you you like uh, send them Tron USDT, so they just reissue one like one one to one mapping. But that's like fungible. But uh, I think the public can mm -hmm. apply here. Okay. Yeah, and it, it and and some may not want to do that, right? Because you may want to mm -hmm. maintain that original protocol. And it just really depends on um, the preferences of the marketplace and the people. Uh, I'd like to have NFTs personally where I actually own it. Like I don't want a signature from a marketplace that they have to give me permission to transfer my property. So um, my hope is that this is at least another option for developers to make a decision. You know, do I want to use an existing, you know, non-upgradable or proprietary protocol, or do I want to use something that 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 is completely flexible and, and open? And so. I think it's just going to be a matter of, of preferences and, and business decisions of, of whether anyone goes and adopts this. Okay. So another thing, uh, are you going to provide service for like uh, indexing? Uh, where they, uh, who's going to provide mm -hmm. this kind of service? Because it's needed, right? Some this service. Mm -hmm. I think unless you want to, every developer to using this to run their own node, which is yeah. highly unlikely. Well, um, well, I, I'm going to be running a service um, for, for the based name system because I need it. But this, I've already written the BSV node off the 1.10 fork. It's been available. I've had it for a few months. And so it has a full spend index and, and it uses the same RPC API for regular UTXOs and, and history. So what I'm going to do is open source the BSV node and run it in a pruning mode. So you could run a BSV node on like say, two or three, you know, two, four CPU cores. And then you can actually index the NFTs and it'll discard the rest of the block. So you're going to basically now be able to run a BSV node and, 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 and get what you need. Now, not everyone's going to want to run that node. I understand just like not everyone's going to install their own WordPress, right? But, mm -hmm. but you can, and it's lightweight to install your own WordPress. So, and, and then anyone can host WordPress, 
And that's why we have all these WordPress hosting companies. So my hope is that people will either just run this lightweight pruning NFT node mm -hmm. that's up to date with the, the BSV node, run it themselves. It's not expensive because it's pruning mm -hmm. and it's only the NFTs, or they'll just pay somebody yes. to go ahead and run that's it for good. them. Just like once again, like the WordPress mm -hmm. model. That's my idea. I don't I want to be the monopoly or the one and only provider. I don't want to provide a central server. I want really distributed, decentralized. Decentralized. Okay. I'm glad it's decentralized. A lot of uh, crypto boys will be having. Somehow That's this reminds me, Ty, can, can this be like a plugging somehow into Bridgeport? Bridgeport? Yes. I, I kind yes, of feel I was just, uh, it's another just, uh, protocol, thinking right? that yes. I will build a Bridgeport bridge for this immediately i oh, i know okay. exactly what i'm going to do when i get off of this call okay, it's going to be great if i can make it work i'm going to see about the 36 on the on the curry um but i'm going to do it and it's going to be amazing um wow. so uh so so anybody that runs a bridgeport bridge will, or sorry anybody that runs a bridgeport node can uh transparently claim to host this protocol and then that it will be made available uh trustlessly to uh or not trustlessly sorry but there will be very strong it's going to be um yeah I, I was just thinking that actually so um uh, i'm happy to work with you on that what is it so and if at each block if you take all the nfts in that block as the mm -hmm. NFT XID, and then you merkleize it and then mm -hmm. you publish that hash for that block now we have a trustless way to verify yeah, that it's on yeah. right and I'm going to do that with every Bridgeport bridge, by the way. That's a really great idea. And I didn't think of it before. But every protocol that runs, uh, I'm going to do that same exact uh, technique because, uh, I mean, I was thinking of doing like a hash of the database itself, but, you know, and I might do that too. But, um, but in this case, I mean, you know, after every 100 blocks, I could, what I was thinking was, okay, well, I've got this Mongo instance. And after every hundred blocks or so, I could just take the hash of that somehow and, and publish that and everybody could check that. But um, doing it based on the, uh, the chain of, of, of blocks, I mean, you have to apply the protocol rules to those particular transactions. But if everybody's applying those same rules and, and they're using the same transactions and uh, you would arrive at the same uh, uh, data set. So perhaps there'll be multiple like uh, attestation and backup protocols in the future for publishing those types of things and tying them to a key that's associated with the same reputation and that signs the responses to requests that uh, go out to users when they ask about certain tokens and everything. But uh, that's all higher level stuff. And um, yeah, I, I definitely want to go implement that. I, I hope I have the energy to um, uh, within uh, you know uh, the next little while. That's cool. Cool, you already got some collaboration working, so. Ask yeah, and I'm happy to I'm happy to talk to you about this further. There's a couple of things uh, that I think uh, I think we can work together on. Awesome, that'd be great. Nice. Any other things, gentlemen? So nope, I don't have anything. Okay. Yeah. So if not, we can go back to the you know, the, the weekly thing we have been doing. So Attila, you are more than welcome to stay. Basically, we, we go over like uh, what uh, we usually released or published in the last week. Other updates. Yes. So I think I'll, last, I'll last time. And, 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 yeah, just. Thanks so for having me. Yeah. I'll be yeah. here in, in the okay. showers. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So uh, basically last time we talked about, uh, uh, we, we plan to do three things by event. We just end up just doing the, the last piece. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to just come go back and uh, talk about two things we released. One is the so-called Bitcoin vault. Uh, second is op, uh, op code separator. So I'm going to recover those and uh, then we can discuss anything else, okay? So first, let me share my screen here. Okay. Share my screen. Can you see? I can see your screen. Yep. Okay. So last last week we covered about the Netflix basically payment channel and uh, uh, malleability. 
and uh, we somehow didn't we didn't have time to cover the, the this other two, which I think is also very important. Okay, the first one is a code separator. I think uh, uh, before I came back because I was missing for like a half an hour, so kind of briefly mentioned about this, but uh, seems there's still some confusion. Ty, yeah, and Ty explained it, and I had no idea what I was talking about. So then we just moved on to the next thing. Okay, so yeah, let me recap this. So basically, up uh, code separator is a. Uh, it's all code in the original and also in the latest uh, Bitcoin script. So what it does is it is almost like a, what 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 the name suggests. So basically, it cuts the the entire locking script into different pieces. So for example, I have show one code separator here. It cuts this into two parts, right? And what does this do? So basically, the code separator only affects. Uh, one another code op uh, code uh, op code, namely op check sig. Yes, it only affects op check sig. For any other op code, is as if the code separator is not there. So if you add odd, add uh, add uh, you know uh, multiply, nothing else changes behavior because this doesn't impact them. So what does this do? So basically, once you reach a we all know the so-called uh, check hash, uh, seek hash pre-image, right? For people here, you've been here long enough. So basically, when Bitcoin signs uh, the signature, it signs this thing. This thing is just called a uh, seek hash pre-image. It contains 10 fields. So the code separator comes into play for, for the fifth element here, basically called script code. So script code, so if there's no code separator, Anywhere in the locking script, this script code just equal to the locking script, the full locking script. But what if there's a code separator? So if it's code separator, and when you calculate this sick hash pre-image, it will cut everything before the code separator, including the code separator itself. That's the only change. Does this make sense for now? Yes, Kevin? I think so. Uh, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It's just going to trim the, uh, the way I interpreted that is that it's going to trim the, you know, all the, uh, the script before the uh, opcode separator. I don't know why you'd want to do that. Why wouldn't you just insert the script without the part before that? But maybe we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. So now don't worry about use cases. For now, it's just make sure we're on the same page, right? It basically is a, is a marker. If you do check it, you will cut everything before it, including yourself, up to it. Okay. Okay. So I, get it I think, so I th yeah, there are a lot of use cases. I think I just showed some, uh, uh, some, some here before. Uh, here, one thing we have we can do is, uh, uh, if you remember, we have the op push transaction, right? A push transaction basically allows you to get the sick hash premium for the current contract you are unlocking, right? So a lot of times, you know, because the premium contains 10, 10 parts, right? And usually this one is the biggest, right? Because the other one's pretty much fixed, you know, fixed length, right? You cannot do much about it. But this one, because usually it's a locking script and locking script is more than Especially people working with S script, you know, if it's, you can guess very big, right? So some people even get a megabytes level. So what if, you know, sometimes you only need uh, the other nine parts, but you don't want to have uh, one megabyte uh, script code, mm. right? Because, you know, I just want to the output. I just want to put some, place some constraint on the output. I don't worry about the uh, script code, right? So why do I have to put one megabyte just to use the office transaction, right? It doesn't make sense, right? So in this sense, in this case, what can you do? You just, you just, you know, put the op, you know, put the op code separated right in front of the check stick. So it cuts everything before, right? So when you're passing the pre-image, it's going to be much, much smaller, right? You can be one megabyte, and now you can only have, I don't know how you, you can add this, maybe like a hundred bytes, that's it, right? So it's had a much, much more saving. If you don't need all this extra data, so you don't, you don't because without this push 
uh, without this code separator, you have to push in everything, right? Right now, with this, you can you can significantly trim everything, mostly almost almost everything in number five, which is the majority of the pre image. Right? Make sense here? So you're optimizing the size, of the, but I'm wondering. Uh, so this is the script code of the input. Like, how do you just? Uh, how is it possible that you can just ignore? or get rid of, uh, you know, isn't this important or is it gonna get lost in the next, uh, uh, I get that you're optimizing, but I just don't understand how it's possible to cut out a bunch of data without some sort of loss. So you did the loss, what I'm saying, but here's the thing, right? So in some cases you need the fifth, the part five, right? But you know, a lot of other cases you don't need part five. So you, if you lose it, okay. that's fine, right? So then my question, so then my question is, well, what in what use case would you not use part five? And in what what use cases would you use part five? Oh, I know there's okay. a lot, but maybe just one it, or two. It's, uh, it's kind of like a will be like a, a little bit of a uh, you know a talk of it's almost like a tautology, right? So when you don't need part five, you don't need part five. Does that make sense? because it depends on the logic of your contract, right? For example, I show one example here. Uh, if you remember the first one, uh, all push transaction, we show the example how you do the check locks, check uh, CRTV, basically check lock time verify. Basically you can enforce a UTXO can only spend after certain time. So in this case, right? Because I only check the lock time field, which is part, uh, part nine, right? So in this case, I'm not using part five, so I can just trim it. Mm. But if you use, for example, if you remember we have this stateful contract, you have to enforce that the locking script is, is propagated, keep, is, keep propagated, right? In the next transaction, in the next next, right? So in that sense, you have to use part five, that, then there's no escape. You cannot optimize it. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so, but this is already put within the script. So there's no way for somebody just later on to say, oh, we're going to do op code separator. And then it, it's no, already. Can, yeah. Condition. When you deploy it. Yeah. It's already. Okay, that's why, yeah. So usually in, normally you just uh, use push transaction, right? You use this function called check pre image, right? So if you want to use uh, the version with, with you want to add the code separator, you have two ways. One is the use a diff, use a you know standard library. So we have the OCS operator code separator. So you use this version. This version is exactly the same with this version, except before the check pre check C, it has a, a additional it inserts uh, OCS in front of the check C. So it cuts everything before. So actually have right. a savings here in this example. It actually saves you. Uh, yeah, uh, close to 80%. Without this, you have to have almost like a 900 bytes. So after the code separator, you only need 200 bytes. So you save a lot. If you don't need the uh, part five. So this is one way you use a standard library. So what if you want to use it any other way? You want to, you want to manually insert a OCS. So we have a syntax in S script. So basically you use the, <coughs> Use stars. So if if any anywhere in your code you have three or more stars in a row, that means it, here the compiler will inject the <coughs> code separator here. Same for here. That's if you if you want to do it uh, yourself, you want to customize. Got it. So is it the <coughs> is it just the line below the three rows, or is it the code between the stars. Yeah, this will be <coughs> converted into a code server. Same for here too. Okay. Oh, oh I see, I see. It's yeah, just yeah. a... Yeah. <coughs> yeah, it's literally like a separator, right? That's how the... How yeah, the yeah. If you write uh, some kind of a markdown, yeah. It's just a separator. So uh, I kind of borrowed yeah, it just from confused there. because... Yeah, confused because you had two of them. I thought it, it might be like the comments where you do the... 
the slash star, and then you have another slash uh -huh. star. But no, uh -huh. it's just you're just inputting one, um, you know, opcode separator, opcode. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there are maybe some other cases. I think I listed here, but I haven't figured an example yet. Basically, sometimes uh, if you have a uh, different branches, right? So if you put a code separator in different branches, when you mm -hmm. sign it, even if it's the same locking script, because the, the path is different, right? So uh, you you have two, two different signatures. So even if the mm -hmm. same locking script, yeah, so you, you can sign, when you sign, you input, actually the signature contains information, which path is going to take. So I haven't figured out uh, what the use case is, probably like a, some kind of like off-chain off, off uh, transactions, you can pass it around, and then people when look at the signature, they can know which path you are, you are, you are taking. So, but I haven't figured out a, a very practical use case yet, but just that's something you can definitely do. You can do uh, all of the, uh... All of the active code path, the active code path can be signed, but none of the uh, none of the inactive code has to be uh, has to be signed. Yes. Uh, and so yes. and so when you're compiling, right? Like uh, if I'm executing an interim state of a uh, of a of a contract, um, like where you have where you have a stateful UTXO that keeps getting spent forward as the contract executes. Um, the inactive code path that never gets executed doesn't have to be signed. Yep. Yeah. For example, here, right? So this is one example from uh, actually from BTC. So just uh, some simple example. For example, you have different branches here, right? So right. Mm -hmm. because if you don't have a code separator when you sign, it's the same signature, right? Doesn't matter which path you take. But if you put a code separator, one is to. Oh, by the way, I think it's a. It's a very uh, technical subtlety here. It's a kind of subtle. Basically, when you do the check seek, it only affect. It, it's not because you can have multiple check seek and multiple code separators, right? So whenever you reach a check seek, you only find the 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 last one that's get executed code mm -hmm. separator. So. It's not only like syntactically before you, it has to be also executed. So in this case, for example, check sync, right? So it's not only, so if, it's, if it goes to this branch, everything you know, before this will be cut, right? So this part will be cut. But if you go to branch two, because there's no, it's not, the code server is not reached. So nothing will be pruned. So in this case, you can differentiate Based on that, you can look at the just the signature. You know which branch is uh, is get uh, as tie set, right? Which execute branch is actually getting signed. But uh, how do you use it? Uh, I don't know. You guys have any <laughs> examples in mind? Or I, I know this can work, but uh, I haven't figured out a very practical use case. Use case would be a C to Bitcoin script compiler that leverages multiple stateful. Uh, a stateful UTXO that gets spent forward, for example, during the uh, each each uh, block of a, uh, a for loop. So, like if I have a for loop in C, right, I want to compile that into a contract that counts down that, that runs the the function essentially, which is the that that is the inside of the for loop with you know I getting passed as the first parameter. Um, then it can it can uh, it can execute in that way. Um, and there can be a separator so that we only sign the code that is actually um, being run. If that makes sense, I, um, that, that's one thing that comes to mind. Okay. Yeah, I just want to put out the example here. So anybody who is watching, the, if you have ideas, uh, yeah, you can uh, see if you can come up with new ideas. Just for here, I just. Uh, Code separator is one of these uh, mysterious things, and uh, probably nobody knows uh, exactly what kind of useful things you can do. So not, not many. So people my understanding, <clears throat> my my understanding from this example that's on the screen is that if you know the condition, it's gonna like there's an if, you know, there's like two paths it can take. It's gonna be if or else, and then if it only if you're gonna do 
you know, it, I guess for whatever reason, you're able to predetermine that you're not going to be in the if branch, you're only going to be in the else one. And so you can trim all of that opcode for the transaction. So it's not going to be as big of a transaction fee or it's not going to be as much storage or something. I just, uh, I don't understand how you'd know that ahead of time and that kind of stuff, but I assume that uh, it's just a way of saving cost or something. Sometimes you have to push the uh, locking, uh, the you have to push the uh, Ccache pre-image onto the stack, uh, which consumes, of course, size in the in the transaction. So yeah, you'd save money by having that be smaller. And the way you could yeah, know ahead nice. of time is by pre running your script off chain before you send it to the miners for the miners to actually run it. Um, and so I know this isn't going to be true because while it may be in the locking script, I'm not using that condition of that, of the, of the locking script. Like that's not the, that's not the way I'm unlocking this transaction. I'm only signing the way that I am unlocking. I don't want to sign this other way that I'm not going to be using because it's for somebody else. And I don't want to sign off on that. I don't want to endorse it. Uh, that sort of that sort of thing. So cost saving, I guess, in terms of uh, smaller uh, locking, smaller uh, uh, script code size on the stack when it needs to be pushed for something like checking uh, um, checking it checking it against what is validated by Chexig um, using um, push TX, uh, but but also. Maybe there's like a legal thing that Craig was thinking, like a legal term where I don't, I don't want to sign off on this other person's code because I don't want to endorse it. Signing meaning a, a legal signature, not a digital, not, not a, a cryptographic uh, uh, term. Okay, because the thing we have to remember is that this only works when object sig is in the script, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. It only applies okay. to, yeah. But it could be anywhere in the script. It doesn't have to be right next to this one. Is that no, true? it can be. It can be anywhere. It's like any other opcode. Okay. You can put it where, wherever you want. But part of the thing is that it's somewhere in that, you know, uh, somewhere in the script there has to be check sig. So yes. Yes. it's somewhere after it. Have to, I have to understand. Uh, okay, somewhere after it, not before it, but after it. Mm -hmm. And then it just it uh, it Cut. will mm -hmm. cut. So it sounds to me like it's almost like an extension of op check sig where you could selectively mm -hmm. sign. You're defining the um, frame of reference for your check sig. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, that makes uh, that, if you put it in that context, then it starts to make a lot more sense. Think of it like um, a, a, um, a document you're signing, right? So you, you've got the top of the document and then um, I don't know, you cut the page in half and now what you're signing is on the bottom and you're not signing the top part because it's been cut off. So this check right. with those three stars, just picture it like cutting the piece of paper in half and your signature is at the bottom, but you're not signing the top, you're, you're, you're signing the, the bottom. And um, you're, you're, you're kind of putting the upper bound on like, okay, well, here's the line that I'm drawing. I will sign here, but I will not sign above. Uh, you know, what I'm signing does not apply to this this above uh, part, this this uh, this external somebody else's stuff part, basically, is what I what I see. All right, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, so good. now it now I need some. Uh, I want to look at some ex like examples, but uh, now it, there aren't now many. It actually, yet. Yeah, and now but now it looks now like I can actually see in my mind like oh that's what this is for. But before I'm like, wait, what? We're just gonna delete. Why wouldn't <laughs> if you're gonna delete the code, why wouldn't you just not put it in in the first place? I mean, the code still exists say. on chain. Yes. It's not like it's being deleted, but it's just not applying to our particular signature. Yes, like that okay. document Got still it. exists, but I'm only signing this part of it. You know, I'm only yeah. you know signing Article Two or something, right? Okay. Got it. That's so why it only, only affects checks it. it, it mm -hmm. As I said, you're not literally like it's invisible. the locking script. Yeah, it's there. It's just when you're signing, you decide which part you're not going to sign. But everything mm -hmm. else, mm -hmm. it, it's not Normally, deleted. if you do, right. Normally, if you do two, two, add, and you get four on the stack. If I do two, 
code separator, code separator, code separator, code separator, two, code separator, add, set. I still set. get four. Yeah. Because it's invisible. It doesn't care. It just, it's not even like a, you know, it's like drawing a line across the page when you're writing so, a legal document. Yeah. It's, uh, it's almost like, what like, legal significance does that line have? Yeah. Unless it's, uh, you sign, you know? It's up knob, unless you have object C. Right. Up knob. Right, right, yeah. right. Okay, uh, but then in this, I'm reading the uh, the blog that you have on screen, um, and uh, it's saying that right now we're using it kind of in a different way, but we're doing it to optimize the pre-image size. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? So this is kind yeah. of like a, a different way of using it. Yeah, maybe it's many not ways. intended for. Okay, yeah, many ways. Just one way would be one use case. Yeah, it's like any other chip, uh, you know, uh, opcode, right? You can use it in many ways, but this is just one very convincing example because <laughs> if you look at the PDC, yeah, line, they say <laughs> they say this is a bug. This is the bug from Satoshi. It's, it's never going to be used. It is a waste. Is a you know, it's a bug. Basically, I'm saying it's a feature here. So again, got it. Okay. Yeah, sometimes well, there are recurring... bugs from Satoshi, but not many of them. Yeah. Yes, uh, the check multisig, yes, check multisig. <laughs> That's the only one I know. What else? Uh, uh, there's also the uh, one where the uh, block subsidy will start back up again in a couple uh, hundred years. Um, yeah. And then I think it was the core guys patched it in like 13 or something uh, where they, they uh, what was it? Because basically what happens is you have the 21 million Bitcoins and then like a couple hundred years later, the whole subsidy cycle like starts over again and then you get to 42 million in like 500 years and then it's like 63 million and 700 i don't know exactly but like every every couple hundred years of, i don't know if actually that was a bug i'm not convinced it was a bug it might be really cool every couple hundred years that humanity just goes on this 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 giant restart, uh, you know yeah. uh not restart but but an additional train is, is is found great reset <laughs> Um, so I'll have to ask Craig if that's a bug or not, but, um, but they thought it was a bug at least. That's just another one that might be. Just fix it. There's people, they look at something they don't understand. It must be a bug, right? That's how I mm -hmm. fix bugs. Mm -hmm. the if same it ain't thing, right? fixed, I'll, wait, no, if yeah. it ain't broke, I'll fix it till it is. Yeah, fix it. Yes. And then I will offer you some solutions, right? Right. Side, side channel, you know, side chain, you know, mm -hmm. layer two, uh, Lightning, right? Fix it. Right. Same for here, right? It's a transaction malleability. They spend like years fixing this. Turns out you can, it's also not mm -hmm. a bug for whatever right. reason. Yeah. Anyway, uh, is there anything else? Uh, anything else about the code separator or we can move on? You can move on on my boat, whatever you guys want to do. Okay, let's go to the vault. So basically, all right. I think one of the, if not the number one issue for cryptocurrency, uh, especially for Bitcoin, is uh, you know the users they want to hold their own keys, right? But a lot of times you get hacked, it goes stolen, right? The coin is gone, and there's no bank you can call to to get it back, right? So this is one one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, adoption issue. So uh, in the history of Bitcoin, people come out with this idea called a vault. So basically, it's almost like a physical vault, right? So you put it, put something there, it's super secure, right? So it's very hard to, to, to steal it. The same thing here. Uh, for example, if you have some Bitcoin, you, you have a private key control it. What if this key got stolen? Then you lost control, right? Totally. But what if, what if it's almost like a savings account? When you want to transfer the money, you have to first request it. You have to move it somewhere else. That, for example, your checking account, right? And then, then you can spend it. So, what's the benefit? So, you have two stages. First, you want to, if you want to transfer some money from this uh, using this Bitcoin, you have to do it in two steps. First, you submit the request, right? And then, once it's approved, maybe after a cool down period, let's say for twenty four hours, if nothing, nobody contends this then you can move the coin again, right? So what's the benefit? Because you have the cool off 24, hour, 24 hours. 
So if I'm uh, the own, legit owner, my key gets stolen. If somebody, uh, if I can note it, it's almost like uh, if somebody tried to, you know, steal my Bitcoin and I have an alert saying, oh, if somebody is requests to move the coins, I will get a notification on my phone, right? And I will approve it or reject it. It's almost like a credit card. Right? You go there, you spend, if you sometimes you go overseas, you spend like $5,000 in some location you have never been. I, usually a bank will send you an alert, right? Email or SMS. And then you can say, is this me? If it is, I get approved. You can spend it. Or if it's somebody steal your credit card, right? Then you can reject it. It's the same idea here. So you, if you put it in a vault, if somebody wants to, anybody wants, wants to spend it, first has to request, make a request. So you have, you spend it in two transactions, consecutive transactions. You spend the first one, after it's get mined, you have to wait for a specified time. Let's say you can customize it, let's say 24 hours. So if I pick on, <clears throat> put my coins in this vault contract, if somebody wants to spend it, he has to first send the first transaction. So I, went, I can get some kind of notification, right? because it will be on chain, so I can see. If it's me, I approve it. If not, I can use another key, basically uh, they call the recovery key. So usually you can put it in something like a very, uh, it's cold storage, right? So for, for something like a small amount, you can put in a key, you can put in a hard wallet, maybe it's in your phone, or maybe it's in your lap, uh, laptop, right? But you can have another set of key, which called revolt key, if this in this 24 hours you find somebody steal your your vault key, you can always use the revolt key to cancel it. Makes sense so far? So this makes it yep. uh, the super secure. Not absolute secure, but it probably never going to happen, but it's much secure, right? Because you can detect if somebody is trying to steal your coin and you can you can revoke it. Makes it's sense. So you just to dead man switch. It's almost the same, actually. Uh, it's a little bit of a different because in dead man, you you have to be uh, is uh, you have to keep refreshing, right? Yeah. yeah. Unless your heartbeat stops, right? Oh. So wish it. But in this case, you only you, you are like a passive, right? If somebody trying to move it and then you detect it, then you have to be, you, you can counter it by cancel it. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to periodically refresh. You, yeah, you're like a passive mode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the innovation here is uh, usually for this kind of vault, if you go to Coinbase, actually, a, a lot of times you, if you log into Coinbase, they'll ask you, oh, do you want to put some of the, your coins in the vault? But that's like a custodial, right? It's centralized service. You are, you are trusting a Coinbase or some other big wallet to, to hold your coins, right? But what if you don't, you don't want to trust them, right? Even you go to the <laughs> crypto model, you know, not your keys, right? Not your coins. But if you really want to be your own bank, right? You can use this as a smart contract. So that's why I put it the non-custodial here. So this is the one biggest uh, <clears throat> breakthrough. The other thing is, so for, again, in the BDC land, they want to do this, but they have to change the whole protocol. So oh, one, one thing proposed is by the so-called uh, covenant by the Cornell professor, you know, Cyril Hermy. If you guys know about the uh, selfish money, it's the same guy. Basically he, he wants to do this, but you have to uh, have a hard fork. You have to change the, add some new code and change the consensus. So here there's two innovations. First, it's non-custodial, but because you are storing it in locking it in a contract. The second, it doesn't need any other uh, consensus change. You can use the uh, existing code. So I even put the code here. You can briefly see. So again, two steps, right? You can you can first move it in the first transaction. It, it's like a request, right? So usually people call it an vault. You have coins in the vault. You unvault it, and then you can you can withdraw it. So in, if everything good, you can do this, you spend the coins in these two steps. But after somebody exit step one, if you notice this is not you, your, your key is stolen, you can always use uh, this almost like a, you know, a escape patch to cancel the, 
the attacker. So, so in this way, it makes it much, much harder for somebody to just steal your coin. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to some, uh, some wallet to, to implement this feature because this will be very useful. Can you imagine like, uh, especially BSV, I, I don't know about you guys, uh, uh, but uh, as far as uh, at least there's no hardware wallet. I mean, officially support BSV, right? So if you are just putting some of uh, your coins uh, in some like a hard, hard wallet, hard wallet it, it's uh, very hard to, to safeguard it. So imagine now you're putting a vault. It's, it makes you, hopefully it helps you sleep much better, <laughs> especially if there's some uh, pumping news. Yeah. Yep. Well, a lot of this stuff needs to uh, needs to evolve. I don't know. It's funny because people we well, it's 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 evolving because people are playing uh, crypto fights, and there's all these different use real use cases that are evolving, and that's the most important thing. But um, yeah, it seems like in order to attract a bunch of people, the price needs to move first. But um, I feel like or at least that's historically what's happened with all these other uh, coins. But hopefully now what we're doing is we're actually getting people here on use cases. And then that's way more sustainable than just this uh, kind of game of musical chairs, the Ponzi scheme stuff that is happening with these other coins. So, um, but yeah, we need to have better, better ways of safeguarding it. And, but the question is, how do you attract entrepreneurs who are going to build a hardware wallet for that? until you have a large market and you can't really. What I'm saying is this is an alternative to the hardware wallet, right? So you can yeah. actually put in a, like a software yeah, wallet, but it's also going to be very secure, much, much more secure than what you have uh, currently. Do you think reaching out to people like um, Exodus, Vault? ESV, um, Volt, mm -hmm. Money, uh, Fabrique, whoever, uh, and showing them this technology would convince them towards uh, devoting the resources to implement it software-wise? Yeah, I haven't actively approached them, but uh, I hopefully they have uh, seen my article. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good idea. Probably I probably should uh, proactively I think it's good to actively promote them. some of this. Okay, yes. Good we, idea. We, yeah. we, always assume, we always assume that people like watch your stuff right. or listen, they but don't. they don't because no. there's so much <laughs> noise. It's like, imagine like, like imagine a room with like millions of people in it talking, like that's the internet. And so if you don't like have a megaphone and like, or go directly to the person, they just don't see it. So, mm -hmm. um, but you also don't want to be annoying. So I, I generally don't, I never really solicit stuff. I just kind of team up with the people that interact with my stuff. But, well, but how um, do you, uh, how do you combat a low SNR on a, uh, when you're when you're sending signal over a communications channel and you have a low SNR, yeah, you just uh, signal, signal noise ratio. Signal to noise ratio. Oh, you, just, signal to noise ratio. Okay. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. you have you to just, increase the uh, the proof of work. <laughs> you increase the hash. TX power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, boost POW, but but just increase the TX power. And what I mean by that is. Um, we can actively, if, 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 if there are people that would genuinely benefit from what we're doing, I don't think it's annoying to reach out to them and just, I don't think they would find it annoying to reach out to them and just tell them like, this is something that you should look into because your business can be improved by it. Um, and I have to do the same thing with, with some of the stuff that I, with, probably more so than, than most people here, like, like I, I have to be doing this as well. Um, yeah, not I, yet. So. For sure. No, there's, there's, definitely, to... there's definitely a place. There's definitely a place to, I'm just saying that there's different types of, it's, but you look in biology, it's like the peacock's tail, right? You, that's one way of attracting people. And that's kind of, uh, that's what the price, but then there's another way where you actually go like directly talk, but then you get a lot of rejection, like salespeople that just knock on doors statistically or not, you know, just like the reputation is, oh my God, here's another one, shut them down. So what I'm saying with marketing is that there's, uh, I don't know, there's there's ways of doing it where you're welcome and there's ways of doing it where you just get rejected 99% of the time. And so, I don't know, right. it's a whole study in and of itself. 
I don't know okay. the answer to that. But it's I tend not to solicit people because I'm yeah. mm -hmm. I'm tired of rejection. So I just let people. You've got to learn to. Yeah. yeah, we've got to learn to like sell. You know, we've got to learn to get people on board and do that in, a, in an effective way. I mean, tangible benefits that they can receive that they're not getting right now is a big way of saying like, look, these are problems that you're definitely that you're facing. And if they don't deny that, you know, as as long as they're not delusional and they're they're like uh, looking at things rationally and thinking like, well, it would be really nice if we had a way to secure BSV, or it would be really nice if we had content syndication or whatever the use case is, um, you know, it, it seems like uh, getting, getting some of those people on board would be, would be beneficial. Uh, the thing that bugs me, or it's not, it doesn't bug me. It confuses me is why do people like Coinbase, what, you know, Brian Armstrong, all these, why don't they just, uh, why are they so adamant about saying that Craig is not Satoshi? and bsv is a scam it's like well it's clearly not like and it works we have you know low transaction fees we have this huge capacity for, and btc and all these other ones uh you know are getting clogged ethereum is getting clogged mm -hmm. btc is getting clogged and so it's like what is the what is the like what's motivation. in the way of them to switch yeah what's the motivation and i think i was re-watching uh, the, the early theory of Bitcoin videos. And it's like, you know, how did all this disinformation happen? And mm -hmm. uh, Craig's answer was, you know, these people came in with a different agenda. They came in from eGold or all these other ones that uh, the goal was to have an anonymous money and stuff like that. And so they don't, they don't, it's like a mental vision or it's like a vision conflict where they don't want I guess what BSV, they don't want what Bitcoin was supposed to be. They want what they interpreted Bitcoin to be. Mm -hmm. um, that might be a part of it. But at this point, I guess we just have to talk about the benefits of what Bitcoin was supposed to be or what BSV is now. I don't know. Well, in sections in that uh, same series you're referring to, uh, theory, uh, Bitcoin, where they go through the white paper, uh, like section by section. Um, in the video called section six, which is the incentive um, one, uh, the incentives there are, are short term. And uh, so essentially those people, I think, believe that, you know, they don't care about the long term, but they think in the short term, it's going to benefit them to continue this because the whole, I'm going to create a problem and then pose a solution, the whole, um, I'm going to obtain power through, uh, through controlling the narrative and, uh, and, and things like that is, is part of it. You know, like I said earlier, uh, if it ain't broke, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it till it is. And then I'll fix it somewhere right. and offer the, you know, offer a solution like, like liquid or whatever. But um, the question was posed to Craig by Ryan. Um, so these people are motivated by short-term things and they don't care about the long-term. Uh, and that's a, uh, you know, that's what's driving their current behavior. But why do people care about short term more than long term? And how can we make them not do that? And right, that's like that, a good question. That's something that Craig said he doesn't have the solution for. I um, think honestly, so in this video, I've referenced it a thousand times. Well, not a thousand times, but a lot. But I've watched it over and over. And that's why probably I reference it so much. But it's one of the first talks that Craig gave. And he talks about this uh, subject of mercantilism. Mm -hmm. And um, and my way of interpreting this, and I might get the definition a little bit wrong, but my way of interpreting it is when people care more about the dollar number, how many dollars do I have, rather than the goods and services of society, right? And so as an extreme example, they'd just be, it's like with Spain where they, with the conquistadors went and got all the gold and brought it back to home. So they'd be rich because they had the most gold but nobody is actually building goods and services and they just kept on importing more and more gold and they inflated the whole society. So they valued the money uh, metric more than the actual end game of money, which is how do we exchange goods mm -hmm. and services? So they complete, or, or another example, I was watching this documentary about the uh, Sackler family because I saw a news, news article 
about how they uh, about some results of their recent court case. Um, but they sold opiates, right? And so they profited massively by just selling this thing. And people were like lined out outside doctor's offices, like trying, like they'd try and get, you know, some sort of addicted drug, like, and uh, these people opened up all these other like little shady doctor's offices where people get the prescriptions. And they were just selling tons and tons of these things. And they didn't care, like in theory, they would care about the health of society, right? But these people are profiting short term um, off of these, it was just ruining people's lives, right? Because people are getting addicted. They they made it easier and easier for people to get the prescriptions, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, so that's that's short term motivated. That to me is mercantilism. And then even worse, what they did is they used their power and influence to change the laws to benefit them, right? So they, and this is on the, the documentary I was watching, but then like the DEA was actually enforcing like, hey, look, you're like, okay, of course, prescription medicines, some of them are gonna be dangerous, but we have regulations around it. But here you're clearly shipping to somebody, uh, you know, a package of 9,000 prescriptions, but the population of the city is only 300. So obviously there's some sort of, you know, uh, abuse going on here. And so the DEA would normally go in there and fix that kind of thing, but they kept on doing that. And then the company uh, lobbied to change the, the DEA's uh, enforcement mandate. mandate. And so now the DEA couldn't actually enforce these things and that kind of stuff. And so that's, and that's what we would call crony capitalism, right? right? You're changing the laws to benefit the company. And mercantilism, if you look it up on Wikipedia, I don't know if this is justified, but uh, according to Wikipedia, it is. But a synonym with mercantilism is crony capitalism, right? right? And so you just, it's profit mm -hmm. above everything else. You don't care about- Right, you're trying to get as much money as you, you possibly can. But money is really just a trust given to you by society to further the long-term interests of society. So if I- I'm receiving a lot of money from society, um, at least in a uh, free market where people actually are making an informed choice and et cetera. Um, I should be receiving trust from that society to further the long-term interests of, uh, of them, generally by producing more of the goods and services, which originally got yeah. me that, that trust, um, or exactly. by, uh, by doing philanthropy or whatever else. But when people are pursuing that money for the sake of, of, of it, of itself. Right. And for the, for the things that they can, uh, you know, they can, they can kind of benefit from without, without caring about anything else. Um, what they're doing is two things. I think they're abusing the trust that was given by society to them. And, um, and also I think that uh, in doing that um, they are uh, sort of changing the, uh, well, I, I forgot what the second thing is, but they're 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 definitely abusing the trust that was given to them, to, to you know to do good and 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 then if they go and change the laws and try to make it so that they are an entrenched uh, so they are a a well established uh, power that can't be easily removed because they yeah. are regulatory you know people on their side who are going to use force and whatever else to uh, to further their ends. Um, yeah. They've, created a system that abuses trust and uh and eventually it becomes non-voluntary and, and you see bad things happen, for sure and then so in, anyways in that video that i've referenced a thousand times of course i'm being uh exaggerating a little bit but i've referenced it a couple times at least um in that he also says um you know that these people are forgetting what the purpose of money is in the first place and it's it's a call on the goods and services of society, right? That's what money. So if you have 2% of the money, then you have a call on 2% of the goods and services being produced by that society that's exchanging that money. Does that make sense? But if you're just, if you're just going for money and you're destroying society, then you're actually destroying all the goods and services that are being produced, but you're just getting the money, which would be similar to what the Sackler family was doing. Or you could also see it with uh, at the olden days with uh, Spain, with the conquistadors that were bringing home all the gold, right? 
they were just they were just uh, you know inflating the currency um, in the case of Spain. But I don't know. I'm I'm trying to to merge these things. But the way that all relates and where we got started on this conversation is, you know, th- th- what are they doing? Like BTC clearly doesn't work. It's like it's ten transactions per second. It's all messed up. And then you have somebody comes forward and demonstrates that he's Satoshi and nobody will look at it. And yet he has the solution to fix it. Like I'm, I'm trying to understand what's the, what's the mental block? Like, why are these people not, and maybe I don't even have to worry about it, but it's just frustrating when you see they get all the attention on CNBC and all this kind of stuff. Like that should be BSV people. It doesn't, it's just such a shame to see this happening and I don't want it to happen anymore. So I'm trying to brainstorm, but I think it's happening. I think we're, we're slowly making progress. And uh, Kurt was on that uh, value show podcast and we're slowly making progress. Like I got, I should stay uh, more positive, but I just want it to happen. I, 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 I'm just frustrated that this happened again. Like we've seen it in history happen with all sorts of stuff. And it's like, I just want, you know, the authentic person to win. Right. I mean, you know, the price of BSV right now is just what, $115 or something this morning. I looked at it. Um, yeah. And that sucks. Like, um, you know, they're what, 60,000 at the moment um, or some, well, no, no, they're actually lower than that now. They, but they the, the thing that bothers me more, like, I don't care about the, I mean, the money, like, okay, like, obviously I wouldn't want them to have it if, in the perfect world. But the thing mm-hmm. that bothers me is now they're defining the narrative on CNBC with the policymakers in Washington. Right. You see what I mean? Like that, right. that's what really bothers me is they're spreading because they have the clout, I guess is the right, right. word for that. They're, they're now using that to spread all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And then people will listen to them instead of us. Cause they look at the market price of BSV and they're like, Oh, it's, you know, whatever. It's chunk. And so, that. yeah, it's, uh, but the cool thing is, is, you know, Craig has all, he could basically crash the price tomorrow. <laughs> so if you wanted to move all the stuff, so he, he ultimately has the ultimate power, but um, I just. Uh, the best way to exercise ultimate power is to choose not to use it. Yep. If you choose but, to use ultimate power, you've, um, I mean, if you truly have ultimate power, like uh, that's a philosophical thing, but. Uh, I would say yeah, the best way, I mean, you know. Yeah, but uh, I, I don't know. I just, uh, I don't know. Yeah. What the, I was just throwing out some ideas. I think most of the, of why people haven't moved on from like other like coins that won't work is because they haven't seen anything in full action on a chain like BSV. Because think about it, how many how many people actually build some like reasonable wealth using a product that's built on BSV? Like there's not many of them, but people have amassed really large amounts of money by just holding BTC. But that's that's the short-term thinking that you were talking about, right? But it's it's it eventually sorts out. Like yeah, people people will start to make uh, steady income with products that are built on a scalable blockchain but price won't go forever up so like BTC guys are hoping for and that's the only like uh, pitch they have for mm-hmm. yeah the, the funny thing is, is there's all these use cases on BSV but then on BT like they, people don't even use BTC to buy coffee anymore and that kind of stuff it's like there's really no use case for it other than investment but it's well what are you investing in oh you're investing it's like the greater fool theory like there's no it's a game of musical chairs it's like there's no real use case for btc um so they've made so they've made all this money, but it's just on the hype, and it's gonna crash eventually. There's no way that I see it continuing, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'll... it it will. Once people start like actually making money with actually useful stuff, they'll switch. 
sooner or mm. later. Like yep. nobody, nobody is that ex except of those extreme like core dev or whatever they call it, the extremists that are like ideologized. Like most people, even if they're a fan of BTC now, once they uh, get their bags dumped, uh, yeah, once they, if they start making money another way, they won't care. Like, screw the idea. Right. Yeah. I earned 3,500,000 Satoshis in revenue from Project Babbage. Uh, people taking actions using action oriented programming and hosting files using Nanostore within the past year. And so that's the very first, this is the 2021 Project Babbage annual uh, revenue disclosure. All right. <laughs> okay. No oh, financial advice. Satoshi. Should all AP. Okay. Everybody <laughs> AP thing. All right. I think uh, probably it's a good time to end. I think uh, we cover a lot of uh, technical stuff and uh, non-technical stuff today. So just to reduce the noise level so people can get the signal. We can, mm -hmm. anything else quick? Oh, we can call it a day. I, I just wanted to say that Ty, when you talked about, it's a really nice way of putting it, that companies abuse the trust they get from society. That's mm -hmm. crony capitalism. And it reminded me of my favorite quote for, from Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, they trust me, dumb fucks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is it real? I, I thought it was that's, that's real. Yeah, yeah. It's it's an SMS or something like that. It's it's really. I think it's an early email. He is talking about the passwords where they just uh, gave all the passwords or something. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I have to verify it anyway. <laughs> yeah. It was very very early, and he's still a college student. Yeah. Okay. So. That's yeah. uh, it's, that's good excuse. All right. We're not asking for password for logging to this conference, so. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, your uh, Bitcoin private key, unless you are using Bitcoin no. vault. Bitcoin vault. Okay. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, good talking, and uh, I hope to see you all next week. All right. Okay. See you. Enjoy the rest Thanks, day. Guys. Okay. Enjoy the rest day. You too. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.